I would like to want to to read a, a passage that at the beginning uh, of my Christian life really gave me a lot of trouble and a lot of problems about God's justice and love. It's in 1 Samuel 15 and it's the record, the historical record of an account that took place around 1000 BC. And uh, it's 1 Samuel 15 and that's about page 247, 247 in that black RSV. I used to read this among other passages in the Old Testament and wonder if God was a God of justice or love at all. I felt, no, this is some kind of pagan, uh, wrathful God who has no kindliness in him. And uh, 1 Samuel 15, and some of you will recognize it once we get started. And Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore hearken to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Now I used to think, well, maybe that was just a kind of one mistaken verse. Uh, but then the rest of the story doesn't back that up. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 men on foot and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. Now you have to think, well, ah, that was God telling them, don't destroy them all. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I repent that I have made Saul king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel. And behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleating of the sheep in my ears? and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, Say on. And then Samuel not only rebuked Saul for not destroying all the Amalekites, the children and everything, but then you see in verse 32, Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death has passed. And Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. I just just reacted against that whole deal. I thought it was ridiculous. And I was brought up as a liberal uh, in seminary and so I just uh, I didn't destroy the Bible but in my own mind I just tore that bit out you know and didn't read it and I didn't know what else to do because it did seem to me to prove that God was a cruel God until I began to realize the truth in one other chapter in the Bible Deuteronomy 18 it is Deuteronomy 18 and verses 9 through 14 Deuteronomy 18 And verse 9, it's page 168, 168, and Deuteronomy 18 and verse 9. When you come into the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering. 
anyone who practices divination, a soothsayer or an augur or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a wizard or a necromancer. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominable practices, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you are about to dispossess give heed to soothsayers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you so to do. And then I began to realize that God wasn't driving the Amalekites out of Canaan because they possessed the land that he wanted his people to have. That's the way I had thought of it before. I thought God was destroying the Amalekites and the Philistines and the Jebusites and the Hittites simply because they owned the land that he wanted for his own people, the Israelites. And then I began to see that that wasn't the reason he was driving them out at all. The reason he was driving them out was these people had given themselves utterly to the elemental spirits of the universe, to spiritism, to spiritualism, to evil spirits, to the possession of demons, to the worship of fortune tellers, to the worship of mediums and wizards. And they had become so utterly impregnated with this whole spiritual atmosphere and attitude that you could not separate them from it. And the only way, in fact, to get rid of that whole atmosphere of Satan's willing domination over the land was to destroy the people as well and to destroy every part of it, to destroy even the animals and even the children. Now, brothers and sisters, I know to us that still seems hard to believe. It's easier to believe when you get into countries like India where you see the power of evil spirits and the power of the elemental spirits of the universe over whole families and whole nations. And it's possible then to see that you cannot, you cannot separate them one from another in many situations, particularly before the giving of the Holy Spirit after Jesus had died. And that the real reason God destroyed these people was the evil was inextricably mixed with the people themselves. Now, loved ones, one of the reasons why we react against this is we are naive optimists. In fact, Sometimes I think we're just unrealistic liars about ourselves and about human nature. Because we, of course, believe that no one can be so mixed up in evil that they cannot be separated from it. We believe, no, there's no one so bad that you have to destroy it. We believe that you can educate everybody out of evil. Of course, the result is obvious. Last year, 18,000 murders. No, in the nation, 18,000. One every half hour. That means between 11.30 and noon, during this half hour, somebody will be murdered somewhere in our nation. And then you go on and while we're eating lunch, somebody else is being murdered. One every half hour. It's because of our naive optimism and our really compromising attitude towards what evil really is that we have a poor old judge who is at this moment trying to decide whether to dismiss McCord's conviction of burglary because it was authorized by the President of the United States. You know. And you wonder where we're going. Whether he authorized it or not, that's not the issue. Here we are in a situation where one of our judges is in that position. Now, do you see, loved ones, that we're in this mess partly because we really do not see how evil evil is. And that it's really bad enough in many situations for God to be able to do nothing but destroy it. Now, that's what he did, you remember, away at the beginning of the world. You remember when the whole world was taken over by violence and chaos, God destroyed it all with a flood. Now, that's what he did with us in Jesus 1900 years ago. And it really is a big step in our lives when we begin to see that the evil that we do is inextricably part of us, ourselves. You remember that's what Isaiah uh, meant when he said, I dwell in a people of unclean lips, and I myself am a man of unclean lips. He didn't say, I speak an odd, unclean word, but he said, I am uncleanness myself. What we've been saying over the past or a couple of months, is that it's a real step forward in one's life. When one stops saying, 
Oh, I do some unkind acts. I think some unclean thoughts. I speak some unclean words. But when one really sees, that all comes out of me. And I am uncleanness. I produce what I am. That's a big step in a man or woman's life. It's a big step when you see that the outward acts and words and thoughts are only signs and symptoms of an inward self that is a real monster, that is determined to make itself God whatever it causes anybody else. And that's a big step when we do that. It's a great step when we come to the position where we see it's this I, me, myself attitude that wants its own way and that insists on its own rights. It's that that is evil and that challenges God's rights and God's position. And that's why that has to be destroyed. That's hard for many of us to see that, that at the beginning. I remember when I first began to see that there was some wrong in my life, even though I was a Christian, I began to see it as just a little bit of irritability. And I thought, yeah, yeah, well, I get irritable in certain situations. And my wife would say to me, uh, now you lost your temper there. And I would say, yeah, yeah, but that was a special situation. And then, yeah, but you were impatient there. Yeah, but that was a special situation. And we're always trying to make out that the evil is only a little bit. And it's a great step when a man or woman sees that it's like an iceberg. And you see the little tent on the top of the water, and there it is floating there, just a little bit of irritability on Saturday because she wasn't in time to go out with you. And just a little bit floating on the top, and then you get down underneath with your snorkeling gear, and you see that there are nine tents under there. And just that the tip is just a tiny piece. And that's a good step, you know. Now that's why God destroyed us, do Because what we do wrong even after we're Christians, comes from the self, the great giant monster self that wants its own way and insists on its own rights and wants to lord it over everybody else while having an appearance of Christianity about the outward life. And that's why, you remember, God did that to us in that cosmic event. It's in Romans 6, if you look at it there, though you'll, you'll know it, many of you, without looking. Romans 6 and verses 3 to 7. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now that's a great step when we see that we were so rotten that God destroyed us in Jesus. And now I think many of us say, yeah, but how? How does that become real in our own lives? We see it, and we see that self needs to be taken care of. Not the personality that we have, which God wants, but the self-centeredness, the desire for our self-glory and our own way. How is that taken care of in our own lives? And that's what this next verse, the one that we study today, is about. See it in verse 11 of Romans 6. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And you see, so you also must consider, and in the King James Version, it's the word reckon. And so God says, you have been destroyed in Jesus, now you must reckon that that has been done to you. You must consider yourselves dead. And that's the way into having this made real in your own lives. And the word reckon is not just a logical word, reckon, think of it this way, but it means treat yourself as being really dead. It's a Greek word, logidsesthe. And it means treat yourself as being really dead with Jesus. And uh, uh, some of you will know the, the Lenski, the Lutheran commentator, and he just makes it very plain, you know. He says, the verb does not mean to conclude in a mere logical fashion but to reckon with certain facts as facts so as to act on them because they are facts. Paul says, take it ever as a settled fact that you are dead. Dead to sin with Jesus. And that's the way in. First begin to reckon yourself 
as having been crucified with Jesus. We're in a light plain. It's night time and we're near the Rockies. And we've lost the way. And the pilot says to us, okay, the parachutes are there. I'll show you how to put them on. And you jump. And you say, no, 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 I don't want to risk it. Oh, he doesn't jump. (laughs) No, I don't want to risk it. And we talk it over and eventually I say, okay, okay, I'm going to risk it. I'll take the chute and put it on and I jump. And I float down to earth safely. I don't know what happens to you. (laughs) But uh, do you see that my safety was guaranteed even before I believed what the pilot said and acted on it? My safety was guaranteed. The parachute was there. It would open. It was packed well. It would open. There's no doubt. If I would just believe him and do what he said. Now, the thing was done already. In fact, my safety was guaranteed once that parachute was put into the plane. But do you see, it only became real to me when I believed it and acted as if I believed it. Now, it's the same with being crucified with Christ. Dear ones, All the evil in you and me that needs to be destroyed has been destroyed in Jesus. But that can only become real in us if we believe that and act as if we have been crucified with Christ, act as if we are dead, act as if we have no rights of our own, act as if we have no clothes to protect and to, 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 to look after. Act as if we have no future to ensure. Act as if we have no career to worry about. Act as if we have no reputation to guard. It only all becomes real when we believe that that has actually taken place. Now to some of us, you see, it's a kind of problem to think that something that happened to us 1900 years ago can happen to us now. But it's only a problem to us who are closed in our finite system of time and space to an infinite God to whom all space and time are one great eternal present, there is no problem in doing something 1900 years ago and making it real today. For him, it is all one great eternal present. And the fact is that this can be made real in us if we're ready to believe it and if we're ready to act as if it's true. But many of us who are Christians and have trouble with anger and jealousy and envy and impatience and unclean thoughts and wrong attitudes and self-glory, many of us come to this and we still don't understand that we're to look at what has happened in Jesus rather than what is happening in ourselves. And what we often do is we hear something like this said this morning and we say, all right, I'm going to take it as a fact that I'm crucified with Christ. That all my rights have been destroyed, that my future is already utterly in God's hands, and that I have no rights to rebuke anyone, I have no rights to demand that anyone does things in the time that I want them to. And we hear that today, and we take a stand. And tomorrow, somebody says something, and the temper goes. And we look not at the fact of our death with Christ, We do not reckon that we are dead with Christ on the basis of what God says. We look at our own experience and we say, Ah, it wasn't true. I'm not crucified with Christ. Otherwise I wouldn't have lost my temper like that. And so many of us go up and down, up and down like that and never come into any deliverance from selfish will in our own lives. Because we take a stand on the thing and then when we lose our temper or we get impatient or we get angry, then we look at our experience. Now, brothers and sisters, the first meaning of reckoning or considering, that Greek word, the first meaning of it is that you consider on the basis of what God says is true, not on the basis of your own personal experience of moral impotence, but that you look at what God has said is true and that you never, you never stray from it. Even when anger or jealousy or envy is present in your life, You say, Father, I believe your word that I have been crucified with Christ. And I know that only on that basis can you make this real inside me. But loved ones, you have to hold to what God has said is true. You can't change every now and again and look at your own inner experience. You have to look at Jesus on the cross and say, Father, you destroyed Jesus and I know the reason you destroyed him was you put all of us in him and destroyed us with him. I believe it. 
I believe that I've been crucified with Christ. Whatever I feel like, whatever my anger tells me, I believe I've been crucified with Christ. Loved ones, only if you take that stand is God ever able to actualize the thing in your own life. But if you refuse to take that stand, God can do nothing with you. The Holy Spirit can only work on the basis of your believing God's word. And if you say to me, believe God's word in contradiction to my own experience, yeah, that's it. You believe God's word in contradiction to your own experience. Water skis, you know that, uh, that crucial moment? It's wild, isn't it? You know that moment just before you actually get up? And you just, it doesn't look like you're getting up at all. The water is coming all around you. One ski is going out that direction, the other that way. The motor is just about to kill, and you just, you're sure it won't go up. But there's a moment of truth when you hang on and you believe what you've seen other people doing, whatever it feels like yourself. You hang on to the rope and you feel, yeah, it'll go if I hang on long enough. Maybe up with two broken legs, but I'll be there. <laughs> but dear ones, you know that, that in a thing like water skiing, and there are many other things like that, that you only get through to them because you believe what somebody has said. If you keep your legs like that and keep your arms like that, you're going to come up. Now, it's that way with Jesus, you see. It really has to be loved ones. You won't find any deliverance from selfish will unless you keep believing that you have been crucified with Christ. And eventually, then the Holy Spirit will be able to do something with that. Now, you may say, you can see that that's utterly different from the error or the heresy that many Christians got into in the past, where they said, we must crucify ourselves. And they would beat their bodies and they would be cruel to their feelings to try to crucify themselves. God's word is utterly different. He says, you have been crucified. Believe it. You have been crucified. You don't need to crucify yourselves. You have been crucified in my son. Believe that with all your heart. And then act as if that's true. Now you may say, in a sort of suggestion. And I think a lot of people interpret, consider or reckon as sort of suggestion. They say, that's it. I just keep saying, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. I'm crucified with Christ, I'm crucified with Christ, I'm crucified with Christ. And the anger's just welling up inside them when they say, I'm crucified with Christ, I'm crucified with Christ. Loved ones, order suggestion or the power of positive thinking is only useful to do things that men have control over themselves. In that sense, the power of positive thinking is real. You know that in, through your training in sports at school and through the whole theory of cheerleaders. The, the whole principles underlying that kind of thing is the power of positive thinking. Think right and you'll be right. And that works when you're dealing with things over which men have control. But it doesn't work with something over which only God has control. It's not a case of think crucified and you'll be crucified. God wants you to believe that you've been crucified with Christ, but not because that actual belief will do the job, but because he has told you that that is true and you must believe it. And he is only to act, able to act on the basis of that. But there's only one person who is able to make that real in your life. And that is, well, the person mentioned, if you like to look at it there, in John 16 and verse 14. John 16 and 14. It's page 940. 940. John 16 and verse 14. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And the Greek word is impart it to you. Make it real in you. For he will take what is mine and impart it to you or make it real in you. Now who is the he? It certainly isn't the power of positive thinking. It's verse 13 there. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And then he will take what is mine and make it real in you. Now only the Holy Spirit is able to make your crucifixion with Christ real in you. Only he is able to apply it to your selfish will. And so the only thing a person can do is believe with all his heart that he's been crucified with Christ. And then go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, is there any part of me that is not willing to receive this crucifixion? Is there any area of my life where I myself am not willing to give up my own rights? Or were I not willing not to have my own way? Is there any place, Holy Spirit, any besetting sin that I am not willing to put on the cross? And then the Holy Spirit will begin to give you revelation. But loved ones, that's what we need. We need to believe 
the fact of our death with Christ rather than our own personal experience of moral impotence. And we have to believe that the Holy Spirit will give us revelation as to what way we're not willing to be crucified with Christ rather than introspection and auto-suggestion. And do you see that it is really a supernatural way? Because the human ways we've tried on our own. But this is a way that is wholly governed and wholly controlled by the Holy Spirit. And other ones I tell you, there is just a different life waiting for you on the other side of that tomb. There really is. There just is a life of deliverance from uncleanness in your own attitude, from pride and from envy and jealousy that is miraculous. And God can make it real in you if you will take the first step of considering yourselves dead indeed unto sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And if you'll begin to believe that, instead of continually looking at your own personal experience, and if you'll begin to trust the Holy Spirit to show you where you're not willing to experience that, God will make it real in you. And loved ones, that's what we need. You know, all of us in this place, every one of us needs to experience that. To leave behind that old self once and for all, that old miserable self that has developed so many selfish ways. And leave it once and for all behind and forget it. And let Jesus live in us freely. And it really is a different kind of life. And it's, it's the only answer, you know. It's the only answer to that envy and jealousy and anger and all those things that you know, you and I have tried for so long to face. And it is possible to enter in. Believe me. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we want this. We want a life of victory. Holy Spirit, we know that it's our envy, it's our impatience and our irritability that destroy our home lives, destroy our own personal witness. Holy Spirit, we don't know how big self is, but it seems to grow like a massive giant inside us at times. Holy Spirit, we're going to set our minds on what God has told us is true, that he's already destroyed us, that we're buried now, that our funeral took place 1900 years ago, and that we are now with him in Jesus at his right hand. And now, Holy Spirit, you are the only one can make this real in us. So would you show us if there's any place where we're willing to believe it, but we're will not willing to have it made real in us? Will you show us if there is any place where we're not willing to die to self? Holy Spirit, wherever it is, it's different for all of us. If it's in our man-woman relationships, or if it's in our relationships with our parents, or if it's in our attitude to our career or our job, or our reputation or our appearance. If there's any place where we're not willing to be exactly as Jesus was on the cross, insulted by everybody, opposed by everybody, and destroyed unjustly, if there's any place where we're not willing to come into this death with him, will you reveal that to us? Because, Holy Spirit, we know this is God's will for us. This is why he did destroy us in Jesus, so that he could actually destroy the evil in us here in this present life. We trust you to lead us into this for Jesus' glory in our lives. Amen.